Well, two most important things in a Christian life. Becoming a Christian and then getting rewards in heaven. Staying faithful. Getting blessed. The Christian, becoming a Christian and then the Christian life. Well, that all has to do with forgiveness. Forgiveness unto eternal life in order to become a Christian. A man's sins are never the issue relative to salvation unto eternal life since God has reconciled that issue with man at the cross. God's Word teaches that the issue of forgiveness of sins of an individual at any age is always, always settled at the point of trusting alone in Christ alone for eternal life. Since God has reconciled all men to himself by providing a way through Jesus Christ to eternal life, quote, unquote, not counting men's sins against them, then the penalty for sins is not the issue. But receiving forgiveness and the gift of God's absolute righteousness, on the other hand, is. It's not the issue for anybody, the worst of humanity and the best. The issue is your sins aren't the issue. Your personal forgiveness is. Let's take a look at 2 Cor 5, 18 and 19. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Compare 1 John 2.2. 2. He, Christ, is the atoning sacrifice for our believers' sins, all believers' sins, and all mankind's sins. Because here it goes. Finish the verse. 1 John 2.2. 2. He, Christ, is the atoning sacrifice for our believers' sins. 1 John 2.1. And not for ours only. But also, not only for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world, the worst of humanity and the best. Sins are paid for, not the issue. Colossians 2, 13 to 14. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, us, forgiveness. Colossians 2 is addressed to whom? To letter to the church. So let's look at Colossians 2, 13 to 14. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, of the law, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. This is the letter to believers. You are built up in Christ. Everywhere you go, we're talking about believers only, their status, your faith in Christ. See, so we're not talking about unbelievers. We're talking about believers. These verses confirm that God's ministry of reconciliation encompasses the whole world, such that as a result of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, the sins of men of all ages of history would not be counted against them, all men, elect, non-elect, believer, and unbeliever. But when he's talking in 13 and 14, when you were dead in your sins and in your circumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. That forgiveness, that particular thing, is the, the result of a moment of faith alone in Christ alone, in the reconciliation. God's ministry of reconciliation is finalized. The moment of faith alone in Christ alone canceled the written code with his regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. By faith alone. Now that's available to the rest of humanity, the unbelievers. We have a complete study on the topic of unlimited atonement. 
Scripture testifies that all individuals and all in the ages before the cross did not have their individual acts of sin held against them. In the time of Adam and Eve, on through the time of the Mosaic Law period, believers and non-believers alike were credited in advance with our Lord's then future ministry of reconciliation. Look at point D, Romans 3, 23 to 25. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Notice the word redemption, payment for sins. So, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom, Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation, a satisfactory payment for sins, in his blood, he shed his blood through faith. So through faith, you believe, and you have the propitiation in his blood credited to your account unto forgiveness of sins. This was to demonstrate his, God's righteousness, because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. This is before the cross. And promised, gave them the promise of forgiveness, once the payment was made in the first century. Because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed, that phrase, before the cross, God decreed our Lord's future sacrifice for sins at Calvary and permitted the sins of mankind to be passed over in anticipation of future payment for them. Point two. So point two, the issue then relative to salvation unto eternal life is whether or not one has received God's forgiveness, personal forgiveness of your person and his absolutely perfect righteousness. Therefore, paying the penalty for one's sins in any age is not the issue relative to eternal life. We already looked at 1 John 2, 2. But whether or not one has received God's forgiveness and the gift of his absolute righteousness is. Forgiveness of sins in other words, being justified, in other words, salvation unto eternal life, There's other, there are other kinds of salvation. Therefore, it comes through faith alone in Christ alone. A moment of Acts 10.43, here it is. All the prophets testify, Old Testament, about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Compare Romans 4.5. But to the one who does not work to be justified, saved, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned as righteousness. You're looked upon as having the righteousness of God, even though you don't presently possess it in this temporal life. But so far as God is concerned, he's outside of time. You are as righteous as his son is. And you will experience that in your resurrection body of Christ and to eternal life. His faith is reckoned as righteousness of Christ unto eternal life in a blameless resurrection body. You have the righteousness of Christ unto eternal life and a future blameless resurrection body. No sin. <clears throat> you can be transformed to that because God is justified because the sins are paid for. Compare Philippians 3.9 And be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, the precepts of the law, behavioral precepts, many of them. And if you keep that perfectly, you have the righteousness of God, because you can. But God gives you credit for having done that, because the Son paid the penalty for the sins of the whole world. That includes you. But that which is through faith in Christ, so you believe in Christ, and you get credited with that righteousness. But the measure of the standard of the righteousness of Christ is the Mosaic law. The righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. Because you're not going to do it under your own auspices and, and your, your sin nature, unable to ever even have a perfect moment in this temporal life. Although the penalty for an individual sins has been paid for, whether one believes it or not. Thus satisfying God relative to that matter, 1 John 2, 2. God's forgiveness and therefore his eternal salvation of that individual is only received when one trusts alone in Christ alone in order to be saved.
Moving on. This book of Romans, amazing. Romans 3, 21 to 24. But now, apart from the law, you got the standard of the law, which is resembling the precepts in which one would lead one's life following those precepts perfectly and then be declared having the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which is not possible with man. So even the righteousness of God through faith in Christ for all who those who believe. And all, that means Jew and Gentile alike, for there is no distinction amongst Jews and Gentiles, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Those under the law and those not under the law. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this salvation is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Luke 24, 47 and Acts 5, 31 both state the repentance. Change of mind. Meta noea. Repent. Meta, the mind. Oh, no. Meta means to change. All right. Meta means to change. Noea, the mind. Meta noea, the changing of one's mind from not believing the believing in Christ as Savior, which results in forgiveness of sins. In view of all the preceding passages and many others which stipulate a moment of faith alone in Christ alone, resulting in justification unto eternal life, and in view of the fact that the word repent and its relative repentance, one is a verb and the other is a noun, refers to changing your mind about something depending upon the context. We must therefore conclude that salvation unto eternal life passages that have the word repent in them in lieu of the word believe or its relative relatives of believe, acknowledge, accept as true, have faith in, relatives or synonyms can only mean to change your mind about not believing in Christ alone unto eternal life to believing in him alone. Just, just take a look at John 3.16. There's repentance there. It's just not stipulated as the word. Fourteen, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, Jesus Christ, as the Son of Man, the epitome of man, perfect man, be lifted up on the cross, so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. So if somebody didn't believe, then they changed their mind to believe. Because you don't present the gospel to the message for, to somebody who is already a believer, as if they have to do something because they have already done it. And here's 316, pretty much the same verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, one only son, that whoever believes in him, if they didn't believe before, now they believe in him, says that that's repentance, change of mind, in him shall not perish, but have God, eternal life. For God did not send the, the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. So the whole world is a bunch of unbelievers. And here it is. He who believes in him is not judged. That person believes. They didn't believe before, then now they're not condemned. But he who does not believe has been judged already. See? They're condemned. They're judged. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God, the one and only Son of God. The name, which means his deed, which was the propitiation, the payment for sins of the whole world, and in his name, what he did, you believe in that, in his name is his willingness, having gone to the cross already, paid for your sins, to provide for you eternal life. So there's a repentance from not believing to believing. It can only be that one thing. Compare Luke 24, 47. And that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his Christ's name, to all the nations, the all peoples, beginning from Jerusalem. Now we have Acts 5.31. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Not only Israel alone, but also the Gentiles, other